and the um, the need for spawning areas and things, but eel grass does much more than that. Bio. Yeah, through my phone. Is everybody on Zoom okay with how things are looking? I was wanting to say because I find myself on Zoom quite often. And it's so convenient. I don't like not meeting people in person, but you know, as you get older, you don't want to drive at night, especially January 1st of this year. I was the executive director and one of the founding members of an organization called based in the West Panic Territory of Gutton Bay. And we were established in 1998. And I think what I can tell you about why we came together and formed a conservation is I had gone to one too many meetings of the federal government, and I, I know you were lambasting them just recently. Tired of hearing the word sustainable yield. And that was kind of a thinking that we could sustainably take as much as we wanted and everything would magically recover. Of course, we know that that's not true, and that salmon are an incredibly Bad, bad way. So, in reaction to that, 25 years ago, I was thinking, what could we do as a group of, of people? It's always about taking, always taking. And I uh, was listening to this wonderful woman, Trish Farrell. First Nations and was born and raised in the area of Deep Bay. Uh, harvesting eelgrass, I'm sorry, harvesting herring rope on uh, cedar boughs as they floated on the surface of the water. And this was intentional because every March, like clockwork, the herring would come in from deeper waters and, of course, lay their row on anything that they could. So it's either eelgrass or cedar. Dolphin fish, right? It's not, it's not showing it. here, and I okay. don't know why. I think we have to share the screen in a way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Young people. Let's turn that on. I'll keep talking while you figure this out. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Sure. Um, so talking to a bunch of young people that we were meeting uh, on Thetis Island. And this was way back in 99 or so, 98. And I was listening to her as, as she was telling the story of uh, sneaking behind grandmother's back and swiping the boughs of roe because it tasted so good to her that it was like candy. And grandmother, of course, had eyes on the back of her head and without turning her head she asked fish was it good and fish's mouth was so full she could only mumble yeah really good and she got me thinking about this whole connection of what lives underwater naturally and the herring coming in and what else does underwater marine vegetation spoke to different individuals in the community occurred close to shore in shallow waters, close to property owners, close to communities, would be a really good medium to teach people value of the oceans. At this time in 98, well, in federal agencies, and they said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we worry about the streams. Part of the life cycle of salmon but in fresh water, but once they hit the salt water, we, we really don't want much to do with it because we don't know what's going on there, which is absolutely true. And yet we could say we knew about sustainable yield. So eventually I was able to convince funders and also GFO, a wonderful person you may know, um, 
who is a habitat biologist in the NIMA. Got his name at the moment, sorry. Um, but um, Russell is his last name. Uh, he's now retired anyway. Um, he helped us tremendously by uh, telling us not only is field grass possible by a small group of people from the community, but to be trained properly, here's Cynthia Grant, who had many years of experience growing the grass in BC. So I want to move here. The pictures no, are I don't understand. I think it's it may. Well, there's Trish. Oh, how wonderful. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to just show you a video graph. I bet 99.5% of you know what I'm talking about, correct? Yeah. Nope. Okay. So maybe I'll use this as a demonstration as I talk because it is unique. It's not algae. It's not seaweed. It's actually a plant that uh, originated on land in July. Freshwater streams and is now living in shallow waters in the environment. If you have any questions, or three, just let me know. I don't like to lecture. I like to have a dialogue. So please interrupt me at any time. All right, so here's what uh, eelgrass in Porpoise Bay looked like a few years ago. It's um, incredibly lush, it's like an underwater meadow, and it functions as such, except in the marine environment. That's growing vertically, is it? Yes, it grows vertically, just mm -hmm. like grass. Yeah, and it I is a grass. I've seen it sort of in the, in the present. Yeah. It grows in soft, sandy bottoms for the most part. But having said that, there's always exceptional. So in Sydney, we saw it growing uh, intertidally over cobble and going back into the water. And in the central coast, we have seen it on much rougher kind of substrate. So always when there's a rule, there's many, many exceptions. So eelgrass is part of a living system on the coast. So even though sea change has been predominantly concerned with its recovery, um, we're very aware that it's just one part of the whole. And so you have the kelps in the deeper waters, and you have the uh, canopy of kelps on the water and then underneath the understory. And then as you come close to shore, you have the eelgrass and other kinds of seaweed, that fucus or rockweed. Of course, you know that's a forage fish habitat spawning area. And you have the logs that, well, the insects and anthropods. Um, all the way up to the back shore in the forest. So even though I'll be talking primarily about eelgrass, it's all one part of, of the system. Sometimes we get these questions that baffle me that say, well, is eelgrass more important than kelp? And if you're a fish and you're coming in from deeper waters to go back to your natal streams, kelp is the way that you kind of rest and the water is, is slower moving slowing the current when you go into the eelgrass shelter from the seals and then you go up, upstream into fresh water and it gives them a chance for us to adapt to the freshwater environment they mostly grow eelgrass grows in mostly quiet bays and estuaries and it's calmer than in the open water so here's again a, a picture of all the functions of the different areas of the near shore. Who can you tell me who presented for the forage fish? It was Jim Shortreed for wonderful. That's great. And they're considered salmon highways, um, especially in Washington, they're referred to that. And it's just like if you're traveling to Squamish and you need that highway to get you know, from Vancouver to Spanish. And then if you interrupt that highway, you're going to have a very, very difficult time getting to your destination. So that's why it's so important to protect the continuity of this meadow. You have small patches and they become more and more patchy. Eventually, you don't have that highway functioning as it should as protection and food and refugia from uh, predators. So this how it, it functions as salmon uh, highways. 
functioning as nurseries. So the young crab, when Cynthia and I went up to the Central Coast, we were talking to the guardians, this is back in 2002, and they were getting sleepy because they were under fluorescent lights and it was warm like it is here and it boats in the open water. So they were starting to fall asleep. So I decided to talk about what is it? Where do you catch your crab? Where do you harvest your crab? So it's more appropriate name in some ways because that's where you find juvenile crabs and everything else that's juvenile from uh, squid eggs to herring roe, as I've mentioned, to small species of perch and salmon, et cetera. So as they grow older and stronger, uh, especially if I could cite the Chinook need to beef up basically in four months' time in these estuaries where eelgrass grows uh, to uh, enter into the deeper waters and be able to uh, fend off predators by being just faster, quicker. Here's an interesting picture. Right? So the top one is somebody who had just uh, fished in the gorge. Don't know the date on that. And then down below is the one in um, Brentwood Bay where I live. Well, you got your pond flowers fishing and you know you would be expecting to catch fish like Comments about those pictures? Not there, not anywhere. <laughs> yeah, but do you remember catching locally that kind of size? Mm -hmm. See, that's why I love talking to people like you, you remember. I suppose, well, it's, it's it's pictures that they're looking at, but they don't have the memory of it. You I have the memory. So, Kip, if you were driving up uh, on the Malahat on the Simon's Inlet, you could almost swear you could walk across the inlet on the boat. Or every weekend was always in Kinsiga of the inlet. Now. Life, but it's not yeah. the, the kind of uh, salmon. Yes, and they uh, develop the quarry. Quite possible. It's going to happen over time. So, so it's also a natural um, marine protected area. And by that, I mean there isn't a lot of fishing in the very shallow waters. And I'm talking waters from zero to about minus seven or eight in this area. You see? Um, there is anchoring, and that's one of the major impacts that we have on, the, on, on fragmenting the beds. But for the most part, it is a really um, calm area where much uh, spawning happens, where juveniles are able to grow into maturity, to grow into deeper waters. Of course, it's a great breeding area as well. So here's just some pictures of hairy roll and squid eggs and juvenile calves, just to give you a sense of that. Do you remember the herring roll? And where would you find it? Yes, but I mean, back in the day, where would you find this kind of herring roll? About Driftwood and eelgrass. So I'm not saying eelgrass is the only place that herring will lay the eggs. They'll lay anywhere when they're ready, they ready, right? And then this is just a picture of the food web. It's a very, very complex food web that three-dimensional um, habitat offers. I remember the very first eelgrass transplant that we did in 2000 was in Todd Inlet. And I was still a diver then, and uh, we had spent the day catching the washers on each blade, and then we plant those plants in groups of ten under the water. And I came early the next check the bed, see how it was doing, and see if we planted it well, and um, just shocked to see how many. Juvenile crabs were just migrating into the bed because prior to our planting was a two-dimensional muddy black. There was no protection from predators. Um, 
no food. And there they were just destroying it. it I had put up some signs that say condos uh, free today on the place and they were rushing in. And it was just such a dramatic, um, dramatic story of what we were doing. And all the way the food chain, of course, as, as well as the porch fish, the habitat, uh, offer all the species to mature so that over time, as they mature, they offer uh, food for the top of the food chain. And of course, blue carbon. Has anybody heard that term, blue carbon? Great. A few years ago, we knew about trees, but we didn't think about kelp and eelgrass and about the ocean and how much the ocean captures carbon from the atmosphere. So I'm glad to hear that Sue is not in charge. So at First Nations use this plant extensively from the seeds all the way down to the rhizome. So the rhizome is the ground stem. And what the people on Zoom. The roots are attached. Rhizomes would be separated from the plant, dipped in ulican grease used for food and sex um, by all kinds of things were made from the, the blades as well as what including cooking. So I'm going to just pass these around because what differentiates it from seaweed? Seaweeds just hold on to rocks with hold fast bottom of the plants and they don't really um they just hold fast so that the currents and the waves don't displace the plant. Plants that through the roots get nutrients from the from the seabed and act uh, similarly, so just like land plants. Yes. You see, when you get old, it always happens. I had two minutes before I needed to come in here, and it always happens. It's right there, and there were three plants I collected. So just drip. Um, many times I go to Island View Beach and, and get my samples there. So I never pull up live ones. I get again from beach rats. How efficient is eel grass at spreading? So that's exactly what I was going to get into. I am talking about the rhizome. Uh, and my um, talk about it more is that you can have just a few of these plants, and if the conditions are right, they grow most successfully rhizomatically, which means they're clones. So when this rhizome spreads at each root, if you look at the plant, there's a node, and that has the potential for another shoot to come out. So at a node, as this plant's going this way, a node might start going that way, and then another node will start going that way. So because they're clonal, you don't need a lot of plants if you have the right conditions to create a meadow over time. Um, and they do propagate as well by seed. Two or is it a month or yeah. two? Or so generally, if the conditions are right, what I mean by that is good water quality and the seabed has not been destroyed by <clears throat> mostly logging, um, then I would say half a meter per year. Okay. But different conditions yield different rates. All right, so this is a slide of showing the rhizomes and how rise to a whole meadow of plants. Quite dense. And here's a picture of the seeds. And I, of course, only had three plants to look at very quickly. So I didn't see any seeding plants. I would imagine from April, you'll start to see a plant that's a little paler. A little uh, pale green, and it'll have these seeds that look like little oat, little oat pieces of oat. That that shoot will separate from the mother plant, pollinate at the surface of the water, and then sink. So you can see that there's lots of conditions that have to be right for that plant to successfully get into a muddy bottom and be able to root itself and not be. So, any questions about the ecology or biology of the plant? Yes. Can they live out water? And if so, how long? That's a super good question. Because in Fort Redfield, 
So they planted eel grass in a in an intertidal area of establishing a So how long ago did that dredging happen? Um two years ago. And what is the eel grass doing now? Nothing. Nothing. Well, is it there? I haven't done a short look. I just drive by it and think what a waste of money. Okay, I don't know about that. Do do Why do you think they didn't see that? Yeah. They so the there are different ecotypes, which means the same species but different adapt. smallest ecotype, which looks like the Japanese eelgrass, which I didn't show a picture here, but the Japanese eelgrass, which is an exotic, but not necessarily an invasive. And in BC, we don't consider um, it looks a lot like uh, Japanese uh, eelgrass, and it does grow in the intertidal. Water covers the plant, the plant has to get taller. So the ecotype is definitely definitively defined as the width gets wider on the blade and it gets taller to adapt to uh, reaching the sunlight. I don't know about the Gordon River and, and uh, that situation, but it's a really good question because when we're restoring all in the restoration project keeps the plants wet at all times. Before that, they said it doesn't work. You guys have tried it before, it doesn't work. And one of the very simple rules was that people were not paying attention to the need of the plant and they were drying out, trying to restore them. So, Cynthia and I are um, beginning uh, writing a primer to find how restoration happens and the methods so that people like you could actually go out and do it. It's not rocket science, certain things that need to be followed, or you're spitting in the wind. And it really isn't that most important piece of restoration is the site selection that you choose your site well. All right, so threat. So in this picture here, you will see wasting disease. And old is um, always present in your grass beds, but um, research is showing that it's probably temperature related that it will start to take off. And here's a map on the east coast of the United States and Canada, uh, where those wiggly signs, uh, black markings are, that showed the effect of wasting disease in the 30s. It so wiped out plants. And that's what put eelgrass on the map in the 30s on the east coast. <coughs> As the eelgrass started to disappear, the plants started to decrease, and all of a sudden, people started asking questions why the plants having trouble? They don't seem to freeze, but their habitat was disappearing. So it's a big concern now, yeah, because the surface temperatures of the Salish Sea are increasing uh, because of climate change. And so as that shallow water starts to increase in temperature, it puts the eelgrass under stress. And everybody knows when you have higher stress, disease rates go up. Threat. And I do see it. But I don't see it wiping out the beds in this area yet. Green green crab, who's heard of these? Yeah, they're amazing. I mean, they are ferocious. I mean, they they carry their eggs all year round. Like amazing. And they're abundant. The nation is collecting five to ten thousand crabs a day. That's how prevalent they are. And they don't eat your grass directly, but they dig for their inverts uh, in the eelgrass, and so they disturb the rhizomes, and that's where the danger is. Who knows what this plant is? You see it all the time. No, it's an invasive exotic species called Japanese, uh, not weed or, or, or see, Japanese weed, and it's wire weed, and it's 
uh, growth on rock. Our concern is that it's becoming more prolific, and I've seen it, but I've trillions and trillions of spores on its tidal area, and I think it has. Are we going to control it? My concern is that it shades out eelgrass, and I think also that it provides a more elementary habitat. In other words, eelgrass has a three dimensional nutritious kind of from the seabed all the way to the tip of the, of the, of the plant, all kinds of functions for biodiversity, and this plant does not. Oh, the Japanese something out there. Is it somehow we imported it? Yeah. Uh, now, again, um, you might hear conflicting comments about Japanese eelgrass or this Japanese plant from Washington State. And Washington will say, well, the Canadians brought it in with oyster staff. Um, so, what? But uh, I had a really good discussion last time I was here. Water and how those water probably is a really good medium for a lot of invasive water is being released. So I know we could have a really stimulating conversation about that. I learned all kinds of things from the audience last time I was here a few months ago. This is a picture of Australia, um, probably from a drone, and all those circles around each of those white spots, which is a boat. Um, shows the scouring effects of anchor chains. Well, the more boats there are in an area within a new grass that change direction, the more you're going to get that scouring. So I'm going to come to solutions at the end of this, so I'm not going to end on the depression. Nope. Log booming. The longer the logs are stored on the water, the more the debris from the logs, the bark, is able to uh, sink onto the seabed, and the longer that bark remains on the seabed, changes chemically, biologically, and uh, physically. And it prevents anything from growing there, much less eelgrass. It just creates a dead zone. And that, ironically, is where we center most of our restoration efforts. It's one of the biggest injuries of the BC coast, and nobody really talks about it. Who's responsible when a logging company or a fish farm or any other big industry like a mill? Go on to the industry, not to the taxpayers. And that's a little political spiel. Here is a side scan picture of logs on the bottom. So you can see all those little sticks. Those are actually logs on a then, of course, we have uh, shoreline development. So that's the, you know, all these docks that people put or road ferry terminals or um, walkways that people put over uh, the near shore environment interrupts that sign of highway. Picture in Goldstream because I thought it was very dramatic. So you see that gray area. If you compared same kind of imagery, say, from the 40s, the 30s, 40s, 50s. What color do you think the Spanish Peninsula would be? Green. It's not green. So you can see, even though I'm, as I'm driving, I'm still appreciating how many trees there are. Because I, I came in from Brentwood. Um, if you... Trees are being gone from this peninsula. And why did I point that out? Because this picture is one of so many that you're very accustomed to. When people, trees, especially along the near shore, they're taking out wildlife habitat. It's kind of erosion uh, from pollutants as well as uh, sediment. And they're just affecting the water quality and the seabed of the marine environment. But they don't think about that. When they buy their house, they oftentimes just think about the view. So I won't go into that, but these kinds of days, this is from Spanish Peninsula, are where the trees, the native trees and vegetation are intact. 
or foreshore and the backshore are relatively undeveloped and you have a natural environment there, we could have that biodiversity that you remember so well. And then of course we have climate changes on top of our uh, development issues and our logging industry and all the <clears throat> impacts that we've had. So I call it relinquishment, resiliency and restoration. Relinquishment is doing what some European countries do, which is just build back. My estimation that nature will win out and build as many seawalls as we want, as high as we want, we're not going to succeed the force of, of the ocean. So it's best now to start thinking about relinquishing the properties that are along the shore that are most at risk, and then not to build close to shore. The resiliency is to see those areas that might act as refugia just during the ice age. There were areas of land that were not iced over, and that created the biodiversity we have today. So I'm thinking of resiliency as far as protecting as much as possible those near shore areas that might be more resilient to climate changes because they're not developed. So I'll get into that as soon as I can. So this is just showing the dynamic dynamism of the ocean itself on this picture of um, the currents and the waves that happen close to shore. And I think one of our major problems is not the people wish ill. <laughs> it's not about that. It's that so many people are moving from elsewhere to the coast, and oftentimes they come from rivers and streams and lakes. Dynamism of the ocean is foreign to them. So they, they do things thinking well, it's just a body of water and not realizing the rules that part of the ocean's uh, way of, of being. Changes in weather and we're getting a more and more noise. So I think it's just uh, ignorance, just not understanding the way the oceans work. Just some more pictures. And then kelps and eelgrass can baffle some of the energy coming towards shore. No doubt about it. But kelps are disappearing again because of temperature changes. So what can we do? So this is uh, just a short video about restoration that I'd like to show you. If you have any questions while you're looking at this, I'd be happy. Ed, um, did I do anything wrong? Are you okay? Beautiful. You got said, I think this was, no, it's going to stop on me. So when they, we had tried several years to restore your grass and couch and Rosalind's there, but because of the force of water coming down from the Kopsala and the Kalachin, as well as sediment. So we went into Genoa Bay, which used to be a mill, and succeeded in planting there. So it looks like this is about 2016 or so. One of the happiest days of my life. To watch all this debris both on the shore and under the water being removed now. So this is the underwater shot. So some Hmm. How much debris on the seabed? You probably know that already, right? Eh? Mm -hmm. 
Hammond Foundation has been incredibly helpful. Okay. As well, we were part of the Oceans Protection Plan of the Coastal Restoration Fund. All had to do with the community because we went to the community of each of the regions that was the Gulf Islands, House Sound, the Riding Lake. What was doable. And I'd like to keep that way of working. So this is um, harvesting. There's a diver harvesting some plants, and he's going to loosen up so that he gets enough of it. Never collects from one area, so he takes. Will restore itself in six months' time or so. We always do videos. So we do a video of the transplant area and the harvesting site every six months for five years. I think it's snow, but I don't recommend it. Anyway, and we, we uh, use some really high-end, expensive equipment that you'll see in a minute. We plant in a pattern. So we use a measuring tape and plant. <laughs> Plant one meter to three meters out in a, a definite pattern so that when we come back to monitor six months later, we'll be able to see how the pattern of the first planting has changed, hopefully into more of a meadow shape rather than a bunch of vines. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. One of the things you're going to notice in a second is how what we call unconsolidated the seabed is. When he's going to dig into the seabed, it go away, let it clear, and then come back to see if he planted properly. And that's what happens oftentimes in areas that were used as logging areas, is the, the sediment is just. And if there isn't any vegetation to kind of bring down the sediments and keep them in place, then other things like always cloudy or muddied up very easily. Areas where there's 10 shoots, each attached to a washer, we use the washers to, to keep the plants in place. Trees on the edge, you get blow down. Yes. Why? Green grass. But you prefer the yield grass to the washing of the green grass. Yeah. I'm talking so much you can't follow what he's doing. So he's taking 10 out of the basket, putting them down, and then he just picked them up so you can dig a hole in and pick them. He's not satisfied with where it looks as he finds it. Yeah, he has to make sure that that rhizome is covered so that it has a chance to get. That's what it looked like about six months later. That just gives you an inkling of what restoration looks like. You can tell it's not rocket science. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, Sorry, my memory this morning. Um, not treated, so they're steel. What am I trying to say? I'm galvanized. Thank you. Secretary Mamai keeps taking coffee breaks. Um, I'm galvanized steel, which means that they rust easily. And what we've discovered is that the rusting, which releases iron, 
binds with the sulfates that are in the seabed. And sulfate is one of the byproducts of log debris decomposition. And when that combines, it makes it a friendlier environment for the eelgrass. Way of planting the eelgrass from a boat, eh? I mean, do you have to have a diver? That's an expensive way of doing it. It is expensive. Thank you. I would love, I would love for us to figure out a way to do seeding. We can grow them in a lab that's already set up for other things. And then even bags of seed. They do this in Chesapeake Bay on the East Coast, but so far, because of climate changes and currents here, be a really cheap way of doing it. I really would like to have the cost come down. You could drop them, but you still have to pay those commercial divers per diem to make sure that they're planted. So there's still an expense to it. Yeah. We're cool. Recreational divers. Clubs to say, okay, we need divers to do this. And I'm sure there would be a number of them because we'd come out and do it. UCB rules. So to do eelgrass restoration means we need funding. And when divers are doing work that they're paid for, Now we have had divers uh, work in uh, the shallow ends, but the problem, what do you think the problem is with planting the grass in shallow ends? Hong Kong. <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe we do love it when we do that, but we don't do it anymore. <laughs> There's a question in the back. Um, I need to. I think we did monitor it for five years, but I really would like to go through it again. Are getting some offers for funding from various non governmental agencies. Go back to those sites and see how they're doing. That's a very good question. Yes. There was a, um, an idea at GWI to plant eelgrass with herring roe on a great Herring are not predictable, as you'll be known from PhD in herring. Gorge, it doesn't mean like salmon are going to come back. It's, it's a great concept. Um, but eelgrass, in my estimation, is doing fine in the gorge. It is doing really well. And I I just would disagree with Gilby, but we disagree all the time that that's going to make a big difference. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Finding an alternative way of planting surely is a, a terrific university project. Yes, it, And be able to plant constantly with germinated in saltwater environments online. I would love that. That's one of my pipe dreams. So, how big of an area that you go in and like is so many hundred yards by so many hundred? Well, the reason I started the talk with saying it's clonal, therefore, you do not need a lot of plants to create a meadow, is that. So we start small 
and we stay small. Because if you start small, it's not. Start small. change and development on the land and farming practices and 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 I knew all those things were happening that's why we gave up and then about four years ago Cows Tribes approached us and said what if we start modeling all the different factors climate change being big also What's the volume of water coming down? What's the sediment load? How can these be mitigated? Then close to shore on the north side, they're doing it up across our fingers. We still need to be here after this set of storms this last winter. But the last three years, after intense storms, the eelgrass is spreading and doing well. Why did I bring that up? Oh, it had to do with experiment experimentation and trying to get a whole lot of bright minds at the table when you're in a difficult situation like the college is. And so um, quality of the water, quality of the seabed, going on now, so our boat anchoring, what's the law base? watching and learning until the bed is big enough to be resilient to change. It's a fascinating process. So what does it cost? Housing plan, transplant. Um, that would take about a day and with a lot of community volunteers on the shore tying the washers to the plants, I would say about um, 5,000. A day. I'm talking about boats, cost of divers, fuel, uh, camera equipment, all that kind of stuff. It's not cheap. I'm not promoting it as a cheap way to go. But I think the more the more uh, it is to select the sites right, talk to the community over and over go over and over again, especially with First Nations of what was harvested there in the past. Uh, what is going on there now, and and just keep the roundtables going. One of the best years old couching has been going over 10 years now. Keep the conversation going. Keep that knowledge going about what do we know? What's the latest science? What is the modeling telling us? What is the monitoring telling us? Which is the slide that I have here. I can do Just wrap it up. Okay. Sure, is is, is you're saying say five thousand dollars a day to yeah. what we're doing? Yeah. Like you can't use divers, volunteer divers, because there's money coming from. Yes, it's a paid kind so, of gig. So what if you were just to do a complete volunteer day? Some talk to your local gas stations, get some. Get, you know. I totally agree with you. Forty five hundred or forty five gallon. Totally agree with you. Get recreational divers out there, all that. So there's no money coming from any. Yes, I agree with you. Body. And that's why Cynthia and I are doing this part, so that this kind of knowledge call us, and I would go out there for free and consult with you about. Use Can you plant in shallower water from our boats? Shallower water is a problem because when the geese and the other birds and let me let me just keep proceeding. I love the way you're thinking because it's about to go in 74. I've been at this for a long time. Thank you.
Oh, this is just pictures of debris removal. This happened in Parker's Bay. Mother the life that's on the seabed. These are the mooring buoys um, that can be used that suspend. But it is a fourth day on uh, uh, um, oh. and it's a great way to do citizen science. We can map with community members uh, so that areas of your grass is. And so we see. And there we go. I was hoping that we would come to get it. The word was it doesn't work. And that well founded in the history of why it didn't work. And so if we can do and I really appreciate you asking me to Thank you, Nikki, for the great presentation. It certainly really fell in with last week's presentation.